In this video, I shall be discussing uterine pathologies. These are going to be split into a series of two videos. In this video, we are going to discuss polyps, adenomyosis, and fibroids. Next week, I shall be talking about endometrial cancer and congenital uterine anomalies. So, starting off with polyps first. Endometrial polyps are hyperplastic overgrowths of endometrial glands and stroma, and these are usually benign. They are most common in patients in their 40s and 50s. Now, polyps may arise from the endometrium, so we have endometrial polyps, or the cervix, where we have cervical polyps. Sometimes, an endometrial polyp might prolapse through the cervix and might be mistaken as a cervical polyp. Like we said, these endometrial polyps are usually benign. However, it is always important to keep in mind that sometimes these polyps may be malignant. Now, these patients might present with heavy menstrual bleeding, with postmenopausal bleeding, or with intermenstrual bleeding. They might also present with absolutely no symptoms whatsoever, and a polyp might be identified coincidentally on an ultrasound scan. Patients might, might also present with infertility, because larger multiple polyps may disrupt the endometrial cavity and can result in miscarriage and infertility. Like we said, polyps might also be malignant, so especially in postmenopausal women, with a polyp size of more than one centimeter and abnormal uterine bleeding, the chances of a malignant polyp are higher. Okay, so how do we diagnose these polyps? So we usually perform a transvaginal ultrasound scan to find them, but the gold standard is a hysteroscopy, because here you're seeing them under direct vision. And in fact, in this picture, we can see what a polyp will look like when looking down the scope. Treatment of these polyps typically involves removal of the polyp during hysteroscopy, and this is referred to as hysteroscopic polypectomy. This is basically carried out if the polyps are causing problems like heavy menstrual bleeding, or if we find a polyp in a postmenopausal woman, or if we are suspecting malignancy. Great, so on to the next uterine pathology. So next we're going to talk about adenomyosis. Adenomyosis refers to the presence of endometrial stroma within the myometrium. So essentially what this means is that the endometrium, which is the lining which is built up during every cycle and is shed during menstruation, is present within the muscular layer of the uterus. So every cycle, these endometrial deposits will bleed within the myometrium, forming pockets of blood, as we can see over here. These patients will typically present with heavy and painful menstrual periods, and it is most common in patients who are 40 years of age. The uterus might also be mildly enlarged and tender. Now, classically, the diagnosis of adenomyosis is made on histology of hysterectomy specimens. So it's actually very difficult to get a confirmation of adenomyosis clinically. In fact, it's not easy to identify an ultrasound, but some changes can be identified by an experienced sonographer. MRI, on the other hand, is better at seeing adenomyosis. Now, management of adenomyosis is based on treating the heavy menstrual bleeding. So we've got medical options here, like the Mirena, the oral contraceptive pill, and NSAIDs. And in severe heavy menstrual bleeding, we can also opt for a hysterectomy. Now, moving on to fibroids. So these are also referred to as leomyomas, but they are more commonly referred to as fibroids. So essentially, they are benign smooth muscle tumors of the uterus. They are very common, and in fact, by the age of 50, they will be present in more than 80% of black women and around 70% of white women. So as you can see, they are more common in black women. Now, fibroids can grow in different locations. So you can have subserosal fibroids, which are present under the peritoneum. You can have submucosal fibroids, which are present just under the endometrium. These tend to distort the uterine cavity, so they can cause problems in terms of fertility. They can also grow into the cavity of the uterus and are now called pedunculated submucosal fibroids. You can have intramural fibroids, which are located within the myometrium. Cervical fibroids grow in the cervix. 
Sometimes fibroids might also prolapse out of the cervix, which are referred to as fibroma nascens. Now, as you can see from this fundal fibroid, fibroids can also grow very large. And sometimes, in fact, patients can present with a mass in their abdomen. Now, on cross-section of these fibroids, they tend to have a horled appearance, as we can see from this picture over here. Okay, so fibroids are very likely to be dependent on estrogen and progesterone. In fact, they tend to enlarge in the presence of a lot of estrogen and progesterone, such as in pregnancy or when a woman is on the pill or taking HRT. On the other hand, fibroids will atrophy and calcify in times of low estrogen and progesterone, such as the menopause. When they calcify, they are sometimes referred to as womb stones. Now, there are a few complications of fibroids which we need to know about. So these are degeneration. So basically, degeneration occurs when there is inadequate blood supply to the fibroid. There are different types. So hyaline degeneration is the most common type. Red degeneration typically occurs in pregnancy and patients will present with abdominal pain and bleeding. And there is also cystic degeneration. Another complication is the risk of malignancy. So even though most of the time these tumors are benign, in less than 1% of the times they might become malignant, resulting in a leiomyosarcoma. Good, now moving on to the presentation of these fibroids. So presentation is related to the location, number and size of the fibroids. So if they are small, they most commonly present incidentally and patients are completely asymptomatic. However, most often they present with abnormal uterine bleeding, such as heavy menstrual bleeding. This heavy bleeding might also result in the patient having symptoms of iron deficiency anemia. Like we said before, large fibroids can present as an abdominal mass. They can also present with abdominal pain because of the pressure that fibroids put on pelvic organs. This pressure may also be applied to ureters, causing hydronephrosis, on the bladder, causing urinary retention, and on tubulostia, causing infertility. When fibroids disrupt the endometrial cavity, they can also result in infertility and recurrent miscarriage. In pregnancy, fibroids can result in malpresentation, preterm labor, postpartum hemorrhage, and patients might also present in severe pain due to red degeneration of fibroids. Now, to diagnose fibroids, an abdo and vaginal exam are very important to see if you can feel any masses or if there is any tenderness, which again is a sign of fibroid degeneration. Now, an ultrasound is very important to take a look at the fibroids, as you can see from this image over here. An MRI is sometimes also carried out if we are planning an intervention, such as uterine artery embolization. Okay, so moving on to the treatment of fibroids now. So this is very individualized. So in fact, I've divided the management into, into a number of criteria. So first, we're checking whether the patient is symptomatic or asymptomatic. So those patients who have no symptoms, we don't give them anything, but we just monitor them with ultrasounds because we want to make sure that they are stable and they are not growing rapidly because that may point towards needing some sort of intervention. If the patient is symptomatic, however, we also want to see if they are premenopausal or postmenopausal. And if they are premenopausal, we want to ask whether they wish to preserve fertility, if they wish to preserve their uterus, or if they don't want to preserve fertility or their uterus. So if they wish to preserve their fertility, we also need to assess if they would like some form of contraception. If they don't want contraception, uh, because they are trying to conceive, we can opt for NSAIDs, such as menfenamic acid, and antifibrinolytics, such as tranexamic acid. If they want contraception, we can opt for the Mirena or the oral contraceptive pill. Now, if the patient is not concerned about fertility, but wants to conserve her uterus, we can opt for a myomectomy, where the fibroid is removed. This can be done with a laparoscopic or an open approach. This, of course, depends on the size of the fibroid. A GnRH agonist can be given pre-op for around three to four months to shrink the fibroid. This will make the operation easier and also reduces surgical complications. 
add back HRT may be given to ease menopausal symptoms. Now, a new product on the market is olipristal acetate, which is a selective progesterone receptor modulator that has been found to shrink fibroids and can also be used pre-op. Another option is uterine artery embolization, where an interventional radiologist uses a catheter to block the blood supply to the fibroids, which will result in the fibroids shrinking. Further research is being carried out to assess the effect on fertility. If the patient has completed her family and does not wish to preserve fertility or her uterus, a hysterectomy can be performed. Once again, a GnRH agonist can be given prior to the surgery to shrink the fibroids. Good. So then looking at those patients who are postmenopausal, um, we typically also opt for a hysterectomy. So a total abdominal hysterectomy and bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy. Great. So that's all you need to know about fibroids. I hope this video was helpful. And in my next video, we shall be discussing endometrial cancer and congenital uterine anomalies. Thank you.